Okay. All right, I'd like to go ahead and call this Assembly Committee on Housing and Homelessness meeting to order. We are noticed today, Wednesday, November 16th, from 11 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. in the Assembly Chambers. Um, let's go ahead and start with introductions, uh, starting on this side. Pete Peterson, Daniel Bullock, Forrest Van Barber. Felix Rivera. Kevin Cross. Suzanne McGrath. And then I would like to note that Assembly Members Allard and Constant are excused from this meeting. Okay, so next on our agenda we have initial audience participation. We don't have any members of the public who signed up. So that takes us to unfinished business. We have a few items here. First is update on assembly approved appropriations. So as I promised last month, we're gonna winnow this list down uh, to the, just the ones that haven't been uh, fully completed. Either there aren't uh, agreements yet or the money hasn't been moved from the municipality to the entities. So we'll go ahead and start with the first of the two AR 2022-221 S as amended section five, which is the outreach funding, who from the coalition can speak to that. All right, Taria Ware, systems improvement administrator with the Anchorage Coalition in Homelessness. The um, grant uh, process agreement has been fully signed. We have funding, we have uh, started the process. We have outreach teams out. Um, we are doing two pop-ups a week on Tuesdays and Thursdays. I did provide, even though I'm not gonna speak to it, some data points from October, um, some brief ones. One of the wonderful things that I wanted to say in addition to what was provided and will be on the website is that we have noticed that due to the increase of outreach and being able to put people into HMIS, along with a huge push throughout our HPRS to do CE assessments, the number that is inactive for the month of October is 88, versus every other month we've come before you, and if you look on our website, the data is in the 300s, the 200s, maybe a dip to like 198, but always in that range. Um, and I think what this shows is, I hope that everybody can see the value that is placed on when we do pushes for our HMIS, when we value those systems, and when we're also talking about CE and all of our providers understand, and we know where people are, then we are able to not lose people in the system due to inactivity. And for those that don't know, you go inactive after someone has not seen or talked to you, um, you know, created a touch point in HMIS, it's, there's another fancy word, but however, in 90 days. So we have now seen everyone, apparently, other than 88 people um, within the 90 day period, which is awesome. Great, thank you so much for that update. And I think that's uh, you know, part of the reason why I am hoping that we systematize annual funding for outreach because it's so important to our system. Um, any questions for Ms. Ware? Yes, go ahead, Mr. Voland. Ms. Ware, where are you doing the, the pop-ups? So they are at Davis Park and Cuddy Park. I can get you a list, Assemblyman Voland, uh, of what days those are. I just know they are Tuesday and Thursday, and they are from 1 to 3. But I can't tell you which one's Cuddy and which one's Davis. But there you go. Awesome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, Ms. LaFrance. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for that update, Ms. Ware. Just for clarification, the 88 people are not housed or not um, receiving services or Correct. Oh, category. Okay. So they have went inactive, meaning that they have not been seen in emergency shelter, transitional living, um, I've lost the two other ones. Thank you. Street outreach. I'm talking about street outreach. There you go. They have not been seen in any, or permanent supportive housing. So therefore they went inactive. So they could have moved, um, they could have passed away, they could um, be permanently housed and we just haven't been updated. So any of those things could be possible. Understood. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. Can I add one more thing, Mr. Chair? Oh, sure. Go ahead. So one of the things, and I obviously don't have a winter logo wear from ACH, which is why I'm in this oversized jacket. That's okay. It's coming, I hope. But the outreach team is going to be easily identified, identifiable. They have these wonderful color jackets. They are a blue that not other that other organizations don't have. 
and on the back it will say outreach and so they are really going to be visible for our community members so we're hoping that when you see those that are experiencing homelessness you see those blue jackets you know that someone is engaging them they also have um, because of the wonderful funding pop-up tips and these are things i'm excited about so i want to press that hopefully you're excited um, and hopefully i get a jacket so there you go <laughs> Great, we'll look forward to seeing that next month. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, all right, so the second item under uh, update on assembly approved appropriations is AR 2022-178S as amended section 12, the housing funding. So we can have a representative of the Rasmussen Foundation come up to speak about that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm Michelle Brown from Rasmussen Foundation. And we are moving as quickly as we can. Um, as you know, the guest house is up and running, um, doing well. We have a great team that is um, keeping track of all incidents, so we can do after action reports. It's a great learning lab of how to make sure um, you know, we run these housing units in a way that's safe for the people, uh, the operators, and the community. Um, we are moving forward on the purchase of the next hotel, which is the 96 unit in Spinard. The Anchorage Affordable Housing and Land Trust has um, taken over the purchase service agreement, and everything is ready to go. Due diligence is done. Um, we're just waiting for the funds to come from the city, the grant funds. They are actively working on it. The mayor has instructed staff it's a priority. Um, and as soon as those funds come in, we will close and uh, hope to have occupancy in mid-December. We're working with a couple operators to see who might be able to provide the best um, operations plan for the budget. So that is moving apace. And uh, another hotel is under purchase agreement. It's also in Spinard, 45 units, but we're in the midst of due diligence on that. If all goes well, we aim to close that in um, January and occupancy probably in March. Um, when you look at um, what's happened with these conversions, so it includes the sockeye and then these three, although the sockeye is not housing, um, you know, it's, a, it's more of a stable placement for people. Um, by the time the last hotel is on board, um, there will be 332 new housing units added to this community in a year. So I really want to thank you for the support toward housing. Um, it is making a dent. We're seeing it in the numbers of people who are currently unsheltered, sheltered that's going down, people are moving into housing. So it's been a great addition to the community. We are actively working on the sustainability plans for this, and I think, um, as Ms. Ware said, you know, looking at, most of them get close to penciling with just um, the revenues, but we do need some extra supports for people in there to make sure that there are no incidents and people can be um, navigated to services that help them maintain that housing. So it would be good to entertain a discussion at some point of stable funding to make sure that we can keep these operating and keep people housed. Great, thank you. Uh, so I have a couple of folks in the queue, starting with Mr. Dumber. Thank you, Mr. Rivera. I have a couple of questions. So I'm, I'm a little bit puzzled why the city is the holdup in terms of funding, because my understanding was, you know, we passed those funds back in, I believe it was August, and it wasn't contingent on you having a hotel ready to go and then, you know, like in some other cases where it's like, you perform this work and then we, we, we reimburse you. In fact, we intentionally did the opposite where we were going to give funds to Rasmussen and give you flexibility to go out and find these units. So it's now been three months. What, I guess the question is also for Ms. Johnson. Why haven't, what's the holdup? Why haven't those funds been transferred? I, do you want me to answer first or you want Ms. Johnson? Uh, you, you could answer first if you, if you have to. Part of the delay was due to us um, because the, the grant was made to Rasmussen Foundation for its designee, um, and we needed to get the designee in place, which is the Anchorage Affordable Housing and Land Trust. Okay. And once that was done, then we've been working with the city. Um, there were some issues around insurance and just a couple other issues, but uh, I think it is close to completion. So I guess before Ms. Johnson jumps in, 
when you say the money coming from the city, I'm hoping that it means the full 12 million, not just the purchase price for this hotel, because there is another hotel, and I don't want us to hit this same delay point again. Is that your understanding? Yes, that's correct. It's for the full um, 11 million 787,000. Okay, can I, can I just confirm that with Ms. Johnson? Through the chair, Mr. Gunmar, uh, Ms. Tenbosky is also on the phone to answer questions for you. This has been a priority, especially for me and this administration, and we I think we've been working well with the Rasmussen Foundation to get it out the door as quick as possible. So is it going to be the full 11.7 million that's transferred or only the purchase price of the first hotel? Through the chair, Mr. Gunmar, I'm gonna have Ms. Amy Denbosky on the phone answer that question for you. Ms. Denbosky, did you hear my question? I have one more question on that. It's okay, Mr. Rivera. Thanks. But I'd like to get the answer to this one first. Sure. And I think we're just waiting to unmute that line, and then Ms. Dombowski will be able to respond. <clears throat> If we were to provide this entity with another, let's say it's $5 million, are there any other housing units you can try to purchase and bring online that are around the city if you had access to those kind of funds? Uh, we have been exploring other options. Um, the, given that the tourism industry has picked up again, there are less hotels for sale, but there is one we are exploring. So um, if there were more funds available, we would, we would be very proactive at looking for sites because what we have found is, you know, if you, you know, compare the cost of stick construction, um, hotel conversions are about 60,000 to 100,000 a door versus three or four times that. Um, and they are quick. So when we did a, we look back at the city permitting for multifamily units over the last five years, there were 575 permits uh, units um, that were permitted for building. Not all of those are done. Um, that's just what was permitted. The bulk were two or three, or, or, or three or four plexes. Um, and you know, by comparison, in one year. Hotel conversions will bring on 332 units. Well, and, and crucially, they, I mean, what I like about these conversions is, like you say, because of Medicaid and other things, we, um, for you, it's not Medicaid, but other funding sources, they are they are almost self sustaining. Uh, so that means their operating costs of the city are just vastly lower than shelters. So I guess uh, my last question, I'll let, you, I'll let the chairman continue, but um, that final hotel that you guys have your eye on, what's the general? Price range we're talking about. Um, it's just under four million, and um, the appraisal actually came in on that, and um, well within the ballpark of what we have offered for it. Okay, Mr. Chair, is Mr. Bosky, Mr. Yes. Bosky, just to repeat my question, I was wondering if it's the full eleven point seven million dollars that we intend to transfer to Rasmussen, or just the price of the the hotel they're about to close on. And through the chair, Mr. Dunbar, um, for clarification, it's eleven million eight hundred seventy-eight thousand, um, and it, we had intended on the full amount. And I just wanted to be um, just to kind of reinforce what Ms. Ms. Brown said and thank the Rockefeller Foundation. They've been working very proactively um, with the Department of Law and uh, the municipality to kind of uh, ha hammer out all the specific nuances related to their grant agreement. And we just appreciate their. They're helping getting through that, but it's our intent to, to do a great agreement for the full amount. Great, thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, so I have a quick question, and maybe you covered this, um, but the first hotel um, 
Is there a deadline to get the funds? I'm just thinking of back to the guest house and how we were in an imp impending deadline and we had to figure things out. Do we expect to have any issue with that for this first hotel that you're looking at purchasing or you think everything will be sorted? So, startup funds, for instance. Uh, um, well, we're going to have a little longer planning horizon because well, we learned last time this doesn't happen on a dime. So, um, I, you know, there still may be um, a need for some support at that first month because rents may not come in quickly enough to pay the full operating cost. But we are planning to um, to bring this on a little more gradually. Okay, um, but I guess narrowing it down though, specifically the, the purchase funds though, you're not expecting to have to worry about any sort of deadlines you're gonna have to meet for the purchase funds or are we good? Um, yes, we have the purchase agreement for the 96 unit hotel requires that we close by the end of November. Okay, and right now, you don't expect that to be an issue, you expect the process to move forward quickly enough that you'll yes, be able to close? Everything, uh, Mr. Chairman, everything is, is in place and ready to go as soon as the funds are deposited. Okay, that's what I wanted to hear, thanks. Um, okay, so uh, thank you so much. I don't think we have any other questions. I um, want to note for the record that uh, Ms. Quinn Davidson is excused uh, for today's meeting. Um, okay, so next we have a on the agenda, um, and actually just to finish the loop, so what I'm going to go ahead and do is take off that first item under Update on Assembly Approved Appropriations, AR 2022-221S, uh, and then I'll keep AR 2022-178S until I hear that the funds have been moved uh, out of the municipality, and then once I hear that, then I'll go ahead and take that off because um, then all of those monies that we appropriated in July and August will finally have moved. Um, okay, so next is review of emergency shelter plan implementation. Um, so uh, I will go ahead and turn to Ms. Johnson um, if you just want to give us an update on the emergency shelter plan uh, implementation, how things are going, any issues that we are seeing currently. Thanks. Through the chair, thank you for the opportunity. Um, as far as implementation, we are seeing success at Sullivan, Aviator, and Alex. Um, as Ms. Ware with ACH spoke, uh, we are seeing a uh, community push for HMIS. We're seeing a lot of success in that. Um, as far as operations at the Sullivan, let me see, numbers from last night, it looks like we had 188 residents there. Um, at the Aviator, it looks like we have 158 uh, people staying there and 141 rooms being occupied. And then at the Alex, it looks like we have 92 clients. Great, thanks. Any questions on the emergency shelter plan implementation? Go ahead, Mr. Boland. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, no, I, I just think this kind of underscores so these numbers that Alexis just provided underscores the need for us to bring on even more housing very quickly because you know it's good news that the Rasmus said um, he was looking at these properties, you know, 96 units, 45 units, but then you know, look at the numbers that potentially it's the 88 or 158, that's gonna go offline. Those folks are gonna need placement the housing and at the, the Alice Hotel, it's 92 folks are there now. Um, and so, yeah, I, I guess I'm just looking at all these numbers and, and we'll, I'm so thankful that Erasmus is doing the work that they are um, and that, that is moving along expeditiously, but it, it's not going to be very long before all of those units are, are taken up. Thanks. Thank you. Ms. LaFrance? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Johnson, for the update. And you mentioned seeing success. Does that mean that we have enough capacity, enough emergency shelter capacity? Through the chair to Ms. LaFrance, we're not seeing uh, maximum occupancy at uh, the Alex or at Sullivan right now. Um, we are still coordinating with um, ACH and other outreach providers to make sure that there still are, I mean, there still are people outside that we're trying to um, get into shelter. 
because uh, it is cold outside. And so um, I don't want to say that there's not enough shelter or that we've like reached you know full potential for shelter. I think the more beds, the better if the need arises. Um, but I do think as far as success, we are seeing people being successfully housed. We are seeing people successfully navigated through the system. And I, I chalk that up to a, a system-wide push. I believe everyone's now swimming in the same direction. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks. Um, so while we're talking about emergency shelter, um, can someone from the HPRS speak to family shelter? Because as I understand it, there are actually some issues there. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Parks, the Housing Operations and Development Director of OPAC. We have been partnering with uh, Christian Health Associates for the Family Emergency Cold Weather Shelter. And I just have some statistics I wanted to share and then also uh, share that we are having challenges with getting enough volunteers uh, for that. That is a primarily volunteer run uh, program. We uh, started October 1st and we operated under the traditional, uh, if you knew that how the system ran prior to COVID, it was churches who would open up in the evenings and families would go to a different church each night. Uh, they would have to pack up and leave, go somewhere during the day, and then go to the next church the next night. So when we started on October 1st, we started with that model. Uh, we had churches that were opening for five days a week and we were utilizing hotels for the two nights that we didn't have a church that was opening. On October 16th, we opened a single site that was able to uh, serve up to 24 people or up to eight family units, depending on the size of the family, and then using hotel rooms for the overflow. But we do still have challenges with having enough volunteers to staff the single site. Uh, we only have one staff member currently that is uh, being paid to be there. Everyone else is volunteers. Um, through yesterday, we had served uh, 38 families through the emergency cold weather shelter and 107 individuals. Uh, 14 of those families were single parent households and 24 of them were two parent households. Uh, nine of them were uh, pregnant households. Um, just for some context, for the entirety of the season for 2018-2019, we served 14 pregnant individuals, and we've already served nine in the first six weeks of this winter. Um, going back the prior years before that, uh, 19, 15, 13, 11, so this is definitely a trend upward in people that we are seeing accessing family emergency cold weather shelter. And so far we've had seven families uh, that have moved on with our assistance to a permanent, actually permanent, to a more traditional shelter environment, the Clara House, the Kennel. Um, but we have had no families uh, go to permanent housing from our program because there is such a lack of affordable units in this town for families. Thanks. So a couple of clarifying questions for me before we move on. So um, how would you characterize the availability of space for family emergency shelter? Would you say that we have enough or you think we're going to be reaching capacity soon and need to look for more? So right now that single site has been full uh, pretty much since we opened it. And last night we were utilizing 10 hotel rooms on top of that. So that is, that is a challenge. Um, and I definitely see the need for more capacity somewhere in the system for people to move. Thanks. Um, so is there enough funding to increase that capacity? I know the assembly has funded some family emergency shelter mm -hmm. through the emergency shelter plan. Is that the issue or are there other issues? So our, our current grant that we have goes through the end of the year and I don't anticipate needing additional funds. We did anticipate needing some overflow hotel rooms. Um, we didn't necessarily anticipate this large amount of families accessing the system. So I think that as we get, you know, we're only six weeks in, as we get better at this workflow of transitioning families from emergency shelter, well, emergency cold weather shelter to other emergency shelters and transitional housing programs, I hope that that flow um, gets a little smoother, but I think until we see more actual housing units, um, there's going to continue to be a, a bottleneck. Thanks. Any other questions? 
Okay, thank you so much. All right, so I think that um, completes our review of the emergency shelter plan implementation. Thanks everyone. Uh, so next we have an update on turning on the former Golden Lion as housing. Um, so if we can go ahead and un unmute Ms. Domboski again, she will go ahead and provide an update. And if any members have questions for Ms. Domboski, um, it would be appropriate to do that now because she will have to leave shortly. So Ms. Domboski, if you have an update for us. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, yes, uh, I think last week um, Adam um, sent it might update him to the assembly to you. I should have this in detail. If you don't let me know, and I can forward it to you. Um, but last week I toured the Gold Lion again with Development Services, Public Works, MO, Fire, Real Estate, Building Services, Law, and Planning to kind of set up a plan for scope of repair items, timelines for repairs, and costs. Um, Public Works and MNO are taking um, the lead on the scope of the specific repairs and timelines and the cost. Planning also walks through with us just to, to take another look um, and we've identified we, we're going to need an admin permit and we're going to need a change of use permit. Those, um, again, we anticipate will probably be paid for out of real estate. I don't think, um, I don't actually have the cost of the change of use permit yet, but the admin permit is $290. As far as um, law development services and real estate, they are uh, working together on to scope out a leasing strategy, um, and uh, as, as well as ensure that our operational strategy is going to um, comply with the rooming house uh, type model, and then um, to see if there's going to be a potential need for additional contractors and potential costs. One of the things that they have identified is we're probably going to be a property management services company to come in and do that. The municipality doesn't typically get into um, short or long-term leases on this scale. Um, so um, Lance, um, Blair, and Tiffany are working through that process right now. And then building services and fire are also looking at a couple of items just to make sure they're not going to be inhibiting factors. Um, once you know the initial cost, of what we think it'll take to bring it back online, then we'll just need to identify the funding source. I have a couple of options potentially, um, but uh, it has been flagged that we probably will not be able to use MLMP funds um, for that. Um, that was the initial um, that was the initial review that I got on that. Um, but we do think I've asked all these different departments to give me an updated um, plan for all the information in the, in the email that I sent, that I sent earlier um, by close of business today. So I should have a much better idea of uh, scope, facility needs, and how fast we will be able to do this. And what I, if, if there's appropriation needed, my hope was to have this information today so I could put something on the um, agenda for uh, next week's meeting if necessary. Um, I know public, the public works director is looking to see if there's some things that we potentially might be able to do with a term contractor, depending um, if that's a possibility. So we are looking at that too. Um, but that's where we are right now, and I'm happy to take any questions. Um, again, uh, I think the majority of the information that I'm going to have from this uh, uh, assessment and walkthrough is going to be, um, I'll have it this afternoon. Great, thank you, and, and thank you for that thorough update and all of the work that you have done over the last uh, week or so. I'm definitely looking forward to uh, getting the, above the information um, and then seeing if there's an appropriation for the upcoming assembly meeting. Um, I do, just a quick note before I see if anyone else wants to get in the queue, um, I do have a slightly different take on the usage of the MLNP funds, Ms. Dombowski, and I would love to have a conversation with you offline about that. But um, otherwise, it does, it does appear that we're actually moving forward at a good pace on this, um, which is uh, good to hear. Uh, any other questions folks have or comments folks have about this before we move on? Okay, uh, yes, Mr. Peterson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Ms. Dombowski, would we... I get the repairs uh, finished, so we're going to need to do one last additional inspection. Uh, I'd imagine it be a fire inspection, maybe other inspections. Yes, so thank you for the question, Mr. Peterson, through the chair. Um, the fire marshal hasn't indicated as the repairs are done, he's going to want to come back 
through and walk through again. And the one thing um, that we were talking about um, as we were having this discussion about the, what the repairs are needed, um, I think the fastest way to bring it online may be a floor by floor option. Um, and so we're we're looking at how how can we accelerate bringing it online. But as we go through this, because there was, you know, though though they may not have been severely uh, or very substantial, but there's just a lot of things that still have been vacant for a few, you know three or four years now. So there's a lot of things that were flagged. So um, you know some of them don't inhibit occupancy, but others have to be dealt with. So. Um, and Brian Dean, the fire marshal, has indicated he is going to want to come back by, but we're, we're trying to coordinate all these departments together. That way it, it limits the time and it, it kind of just propels it to go faster. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. All right, I don't see anyone else in the queue. Thank you so much, Ms. Dabowski. You're welcome. Thank you, sir. All right, that completes our unfinished business. So moving on to new business. Uh, we're gonna be getting out early today, which is great. Um, so I have a short presentation just to discuss some next steps and um, for the committee. So we can go ahead and put that up. All right, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about uh, next steps for the Housing and Homelessness Committee. And uh, the reason I wanted to, next slide please, is uh, I, I, feel like um, that we are operating under a clean slate right now. Aside from discussions during the budget season uh, and in the December Housing and Homelessness Committee meeting, which I'll go into soon, uh, I no longer feel that we are in a constant emergency state. We'll have things here and there that we're going to need to deal with. But, you know, as I've said again and again, um, it has felt like for many, many months now that we're just in a constant emergency state and um, it has uh, stopped us from really doing a lot of the great future planning work that I think we need to be doing. Um, on top of that, uh, there are some highly controversial ideas that are no longer under consideration, which frees up space for this committee and some breathing room, and then that allows this committee to plan for and focus on the future. And I think part of the beginning of that planning for and focusing on the future is gonna be looking at data. Next slide, please. So I just wanted to provide this quick slide for you all. This is um, the single adult uh, numbers uh, active at end of month from January 2020 to October 2022. So you'll see before the pandemic where we were, the steep rise during the pandemic, and then the uh, fairly good decline that we've had since um, it's about June or so of 2021, the numbers have been going down. And um, that's really due to a lot of the investments and efforts that this body has made, whether that's through federal funds, alcohol tax funds, and through a lot of the great work that the coalition and the HPRS have done over the last uh, year or so. Um, there's just been a lot of great work and I want us to continue that and really continue seeing that trend line go down. That's exactly what we need to see. Next slide, please. So um, normally we don't have a December Housing and Homelessness Committee meeting. It's usually canceled. But what I'm going to do this month, just because I really want us to um, move forward with a lot of the great important work that we just haven't been able to get to because we've been in emergency mode, um, I will be moving the December meeting up from the third Wednesday, likely to the second Wednesday or some other date on the second week of December. And there's going to be two primary items on the agenda. First is going into the data. The Anchorage Coalition and Homelessness Annual Gap Analysis, Gap Analysis should be coming out in early December. Um, so that will give us an opportunity to look at that um, and to start looking at that and either confirm or reconsider our priorities, namely the need for some additional shelter. I think the number that's been thrown out a lot is 150 units, or excuse me, 150 beds. Uh, and then the need for additional uh, housing and what types of housing are important. So uh, I think looking at that data is gonna be really critical just for determining a path forward. And then um, we'll also, in the December meeting, be looking at the emergency shelter plan from January through April slash end of winter and likely going to be replicating the current plan in use and expecting appropriations 
um, with the 2020, 2022 Homelessness Alcohol Tax Funds. So I just want to repeat that. It's the 2022 Homelessness Alcohol Tax Funds uh, in December. I imagine that is when we will get that appropriation for us to likely extend those agreements and those contracts uh, for us to continue our emergency shelter plan that we currently have going on through April. Um, next slide, please. So basically first quarter of next year, uh, you know, once we are done with the funding of the emergency shelter plan and having it implemented for uh, ne January through April of next year, want us to continue under uh, getting an understanding of the gap analysis and the needs in our community, prepare for the demobilization of the emergency shelter facilities in April, some of them actually earlier than that, and uh, end of winter. Um, you know, as has been stated, we are going to have facilities, some of them phasing, shutting down, some of them entirely shutting down once the emergency shelter plan is turned off. And so by my estimation, that's, you know, roughly 400 individuals if you take all the facilities together. Um, and so we need to be prepared for that. And I will say, even if all of the housing comes online that we expect to with the two hotels in Spinard and the Golden Lion, I suspect that we're still going to have some type of delta there that we're going to need to prepare and plan for by April. So that'll be some of the work that we do. And um, then some of the other work that we're going to be doing in that January through April time frame is focusing on housing. Um, Particularly, you know, when I talk about housing, I just want to be clear. I'm talking about permanent supportive housing, low-income housing, extremely low-income housing, workforce housing, and affordable housing. So we're not talking about the full spectrum of housing here. We're talking about a specific subset of that spectrum. Also want to focus on policy as it relates to that subset, funding as it relates to that subset, and really talk about the community vision. You know, one of the things that we were very successful with last year, uh, in the last year, is bringing on new housing units. 300, what I heard from the Rasmussen Foundation was 300 housing units in a year. That's wonderful. And that is um, you know, hopefully a, a goal and a vision that we can replicate and continue moving forward. How much new housing do we want to bring on in that category? Um, so that is a lot of the work that I hope to do January through April. Last slide, please. And really, you know, what I see this is going back to what I started with, you know, we have a clean slate here, uh, which gives us an opportunity to really uh, achieve the goal, which we had stated in a resolution that we passed um, earlier this year, which is to achieve functional zero for single adults. And I think we can uh, begin uh, the stepping stones for at least the municipality, how we intend to play in that uh, our role in achieving functional zero, zero for single adults and possibly other populations if we can focus on and work towards true community solutions. So I'm definitely excited for the next five months of housing and homelessness committee meetings. I think they will look very different from the last five months of housing and homeless committee meetings that we've had to um, endure. <laughs> I'll put it that way. So with that, um, that is my sort of focus on next steps. I'm happy to take any questions or comments that members may have, but I think that will pretty much, um, we'll move to final audience participation unless we have any comments. Ms. LaFrance. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And under um, housing, I saw that funding was included, and I'm assuming that would also include a discussion on the operations costs and planning that um, Ms. Brown raised and looking at long-term sustainability and ongoing funding sources for those facilities? Yeah, certainly. So my um, take on funding is um, sort of threefold. Um, one of them includes what you're stating. Uh, a second one includes looking at a lot of the funding that we have already approved, particularly with the federal funds. Um, you know, we have been focusing a lot on the 11.878 million um, that the Rasmussen Foundation or its designee um, was approved, but there's also tens of millions of other dollars that we have approved of housing. So looking at those um, housing dollars that we have approved. Uh, and then the third um, way that I'm also looking at this is advocating for increased funding for housing on the state level, because we know that that is something that has been lacking. And with the creation of the, the state uh, Alaska Housing Trust, I think there are some opportunities that we can 
take there. So it's a multifaceted level that I think we're going to be looking at in this committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I believe Mr. Cross. Yes, as we progress, I would really like to um, expand as, as we clear our plate of some of these uh, topics and as we move on, I'd like to expand and basically uh, also see that we can start focusing on uh, kind of the hidden part of our homelessness, which is uh, children through OCS mm -hmm. and Alaska Center for Resource Families. Um, if you just go to statistics in October, that's one thing we don't have here that doesn't show because maybe we don't pull OCS statistics. 47 children were added in Anchorage um, to with displaced homes and basically into the foster care system, but only only uh, 28 moved out. That means a net positive 19 that they're still struggling to find houses for. That's on a monthly basis. So as we focus on adult housing, we need to realize that a lot of adults started off in the foster care system and providing assistance to those resource families is a form of housing. It doesn't show up as an apartment building, but it shows up in homes that are open, that are loving and willing to um, house children. I know a family that I work with, um, as you know, I'm very active in uh, foster and adoption programs. Uh, I know a family has nine foster children um, because they just have big hearts. They're the kindest people I know, but there's just not enough houses out there. So. And, and so it's easy for us to focus on the adults because they show up on the they, they, they show up visually and we see them on the streets and but I think the children are the uh, unrecognized victims in this and I would really like to see some of this that we participate and get OCS in here Alaska Center for Resource Families and see how additionally we can help the children so that they don't end up uh, the next generation of our um, uh, of our homeless in need thank you great thank you mr. Cross yeah, go ahead, Mr. Volant. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I really appreciate the process comments. My sister and brother-in-law, they are fostering as well. Um, I would like, I think, um, sort of once we get through the this winter, this kind of emergency shelter situation that we're in, if we could add to um, the this committee's work maybe late spring, early summer, uh, focus on best practices for off-site impact mitigation and what that could look like. Um, we kind of got into that discussion at our previous regular meeting, um, and I think some members were in agreement that you know, when we put homelessness services in a certain location, we should also do what we can to uh, support the neighborhood. Um, that might be proximity, and then, um, yeah, I'm just kind of wondering how we can get to a really healthy place that balances outreach. I'm so thankful um, that that uh, the coalition is able to do this outreach work, and I look forward to seeing those blue jackets out and about. Um, but yeah, if we could add that to our list of priorities, I think that would be great. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lowland. All right, not seeing anyone else. Um, then, uh, that, oh, go ahead, Mr. Peterson. Thank you, I just thought we were uh, taking turns for comments coming down the tables. Anyway, um, yeah, so we, we need to get uh, some funding requests from the state added to our legislative program. Uh, so, because the price of oil has continued to stay high, so the legislature might actually have funding this year available, so we definitely want to be sure to at least uh, make a request for some of that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Peterson. All right, not seeing anyone else, then uh, that concludes our new business. Uh, we don't have anything under committee legislative and budget priorities, um, so that'll move us on to final audience participation. Are there any members of the public who would like to participate? If so, please uh, come on up. You'll have three minutes if you can state your name for the record. Welcome. Yes. Hey. Hello. How's it going? Uh, uh, committee member, uh, uh, committee members, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, my name is James Thornton. I uh, live and work in Fairview. Um, I'm also on the executive board of the Fairview Community Council for several years now. And so um, thank you again for all of your work towards um, compassionate care for those um, um, in need. And I know a lot of you have heard me speak before, and um, a lot of us are, are really involved with the process um, now more than ever. Um, 
And so I just figured I would come up and kind of uh, tell you a little bit about uh, how it feels to live in Fairview, work in Fairview, and um, um, also um, be subject to uh, some of the, uh, the concentration of services, uh, the historical concentration of services, as well as um, I'm listening to sort of a, a more wide or broad um, approach to how we handle services in our uh, state and in our city. Um, I do uh, appreciate the comment about it. we're all swimming in the right direction now. It does feel that way. Um, uh, we've been working with, um, with the director of Henning and, and uh, Alexis has done a great job communicating with us amidst a real challenging uh, situation that really doesn't have clear answers. Um, and so I appreciate everyone's uh, um, ability to work together amidst a lot of uh, um, conflicting feelings. And of course, we all have communities in need at this time. Um, the world is, uh, is uh, we have a lot of challenges, I mean, just across the board, everyone does. So um, the clean slate, I, I appreciate that the comment, I understand from the community's point of view, that's, um, that's uh, something that, that is great moving forward. Uh, but if you live in Fairview, it really doesn't feel like a clean slate. I mean, we just had shooting this morning, several gunshots, and we're all asking everyone, please report what you hear. It's important that APD and, and, and emergency services hear that. So. Um, it doesn't feel like a clean slate in Fairview. It feels like an old, dirty slate that hasn't been fixed and hasn't been attended to. Um, that's not a, a, a rip on anyone in this room. Uh, we need to focus on the present. I, I appreciate the future, and we do need to make sure we have a plan in place for future services where they go, for, for Spinard, for all the areas that you're planning on putting uh, uh, these, these services. But we need to focus on that. But right now, we have an issue uh, clear and present in Fairview. Um, what is one life worth? Is it worth two ABD officers patrolling an area? I mean, you know what the salaries are there. I understand we don't have services, but we have lost a life. We have residents with PTSD because they've been put in an unfair situation um, due to these external impacts. Um, we're taxpayers, we're residents, we're business owners. We have the same rights as everyone else, but it doesn't feel that way. Um, uh, we've had a death within walking distance of the Sullivan. That's not a rip on anyone um, involved with the process. Um, we, we are putting our own safety and, and health at risk at the direction of emergency services in a lot of cases. They're telling us to approach individuals. That's not safe. Um, we're gonna do it anyway because we wanna save lives, we're good people. We need safety and security for the surrounding areas of, of, of these services. We need to plan for it um, so that this kind of situation doesn't happen again. We need to plan for those that are kicked out of shelters and we need, we need, we need uh, to bolster mental health services. Thank but you. we need security and safety in our neighborhood. We need it right away. Thank, Thank you. you. Looking forward to continuing that work through the budget process. Thanks so much. Anyone else would like to participate? Uh, Mr. Cross, you had something? That's, that's OK. I'll let him finish. I did have a question for him, but that's OK. We'll just keep continuing. OK. Um, go ahead. Come on, uh, Ms. Burke. Nancy Burke with United Way and I wanted to just give you a quick update on a project that is near and dear to our hearts, the Home for Good program. Um, we've been partnering with the new housing units just so you can kind of see how things connect and we've been able to house people in those um, in the guest house and we'll be looking to be a part of other projects. We've just passed 60 people in housing and these are the folks that the fire department, the police department and the health department see the most frequently. Um, and so we're very pleased with the results. The rests are going down, calls for service are going down. And I did want to call to your attention a national study. There's been some news lately that's been happening in other areas um, with elections, but there was an NIH study that came out that showed after Medicaid expanded, there was between a 20 and 32% reduction of um, arrests for people who were in those states. Alaska is one of the states that was studied, and I'd be happy to send them over to the chair uh, for you to review. I also wanted to just say I love the focus on data. That's so important. And one of the things I would caution is you really need a year of your data going forward because our data will be um, very skewed from June through September because we lost track of so many people when the Sullivan was shut down. And so that data really needs some time to recover especially as outreach is picking up. So that's just a word of caution. And lastly, I do encourage you to focus on adults. Um, the, all of the other populations are so very important, families and children and youth. But what 
the, one of the reasons we're in this situation with adults is we've said, okay, well, well, we'll focus on these others first and then we'll get to adults. But meanwhile, the adult population continues to swell and continues to become um, you know, such a need in our community. So focusing on adults is, is one focus that really should remain strong. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, Mr. Cross, you had a question? Uh, yes, I actually had a question for uh, Mr. James Thornton um, before he stepped down um, part of the, the Fairview Community Council. Um, just specifically, understanding that um, you know constraints on what we can like you know trying to move an avalanche. And so, uh, what would you say are the most impactful things that we can do in the immediate short term? That, that you have talked about in your community council, can you identify what the specific action steps are that we might be able to help you with? Give me something tangible and say, if you can do this for me, or us, excuse me. Thank you very much, Mr. Cross. I appreciate the question, as do the rest of the community. Um, I'd like to actually uh, refer to um, um, Member Volan's request for um, a bid to go out for some sort of immediate services in our in our um, in our direct uh, uh, um, diameter of the Sullivan Arena, um, we don't have a source of funding for that currently. I'm sure the ball is rolling. We're looking for that source. Uh, so to answer your question, we need eyes on the situation. So when I'm driving around the neighborhood, I'm looking for people that you know look like you know they might be stuck. They might not have anyone looking out for them. They may end up freezing to death, or they may end up being predated on by those. Um, when APD drops a person off at the Sullivan Arena, <clears throat> and they don't bring them right to the front door, if you drive by the Sullivan Arena, the old entrance is now all boarded up, and there's a lot of individuals that hang out there. I've walked by there before, and I've been offered drugs, um, not me personally offered to you know, be a prostitute, but I'm sure that that happens all the time. I have a couple friends who, you know, they can't even walk around the neighborhood without getting that sort of a, a solicitation. So to answer your question briefly, we really need eyes on the situation. Right now we need eyes, we, because right now the neighborhood is the eyes. And I mean, our, one of our residents, she couldn't even go to work in the morning because there was a lady sleeping in the middle of the, 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 the um, parking lot. And it doesn't matter if she wasn't allowed into the warming shelter or not. She didn't allow her into her bags to be uh, to be searched. It doesn't matter if she had two totes or less or more. The fact of the matter is is she ended up on the street and it's you can't do this this time of year you just can't be on the street. We have a lot of individuals still sleeping on the street, whether they, they just don't want to be in the salt and because they're scared of it. It's a very cold, inhospitable environment. And I don't mean that as an, a negative rip on Henning. They're doing a great job as is you know, everybody that's looking out for the situation, but some just don't want to be in there. And I understand that we don't have a lot of options. So to answer your question, immediately we need people on the street, in the surrounding area, and we'd like to see it as far as Fourth Avenue. I mean, I know Mr. Olave sure would have appreciated that over the several decades that he has seen these, these impacts on his family and his business and all these things, but that's now in the past and we're in the present. So somehow we need to come up. I mean, I wanted to start a community patrol but there's so much liability involved there. I don't want to be responsible for somebody. Um, my staff at my business, I didn't allow anyone to approach anyone in the parking lot for anything. I'll write them up because it's, it's a safety hazard in our neighborhood or in really in any neighborhood where there's, where there's negative impacts of, of services or places where um, we have a, a, a lack of um, a, a, just a kind of a, a disinvestment in, in the community. And, and again, Everyone has a need in their community. So to answer your question, Mr. Cross, thank you for thank you for asking it, and I really appreciate the opportunity to again advocate for our life uh, in Fairview. We need eyes on the street, whether that's mental health, uh, uh, the Crisis Now team. I, I reached out to them. We've been talking with them. We're hoping that maybe we can get some funding. We're looking at a, a reconnecting communities grant, which is a federal grant, which you guys heard in the assembly meeting. They talked about historical transportation um, systemic issues that affect low-income uh, low neighborhoods like ours. You drive through them all over the country, you, see, you wonder what happened to these neighborhoods. Well, the highway happened to the neighborhoods, and they were, they, were, they were targeted because it was an easy, it was an easy take. So, and then in the meantime, you get you know, disinvestment, and, um, and unfortunately, you get crime, 
and prostitution and, and, and substance abuse, and there aren't a lot of services, and there's not a lot of civic involvement. So I'm glad to be able to stand up and, um, and, and, and speak on behalf of those that maybe just don't think that anyone cares. Well, we do care, so we need, we need eyes on the street right now, no matter who it is. I don't care if it's other adjacent neighborhoods, just helping us out. We need people to stay in their cars, we need them to report what's going on, and people, if they feel like they're watched, there's going to be less of a chance that they're going to continue to predate on those. We need people that just need that, that, that help to the next, the next step. They need to get out of this situation yeah. to not be offered that bottle, to not be offered that. I drive by and I see people openly smoking, uh, smoking um, uh, illicit substances. I'm not talking about cannabis here. I'm talking about you know, bad things. I've seen it. It's on the street. And we're not prosecuting this stuff. We are not. We will not. Uh, our, our justice system here will not prosecute. Uh, for um, for substances, for possession. You go to jail and then you get released. It's a fact. Look it up. They will not for, for possession. No one's going to go away. I don't know what. I don't know why that is. I know that there's a lot of laws being broken, and people are not being put away. Okay, so more more people on the streets, and I, and I understand you because I tour the Sullivan Arena, and you can see the groups of them hanging around just outside the property, outside the jurisdiction of any what they can actually. You know, because they're restricted within the, the, the bounds of the property. Um, and then we, the part of the problem we have on our side, and that's why I'm looking at whether that looks like community resource officers or what that looks like, is, is that we have, you have to be very careful about putting the public in the position of law enforcement and trying to, because now we run into liability issues there. So um, it'd be interesting to see, and even through the alcohol tax, we're limited on what we can give funds to, specifically for police officers and certain things. So even even utilizing funds in some of those community resources, I don't think applies, which is a challenge Dan and, and myself both share. So I think this, you know, how do we help your communities? How do we help the community councils? How do we get more eyes on the street? I think honestly, what it's going to have to happen is uh, it's going to have to be a large volunteer effort to, to begin with or organizing. I see some people shaking their heads no, but I mean, it is our it is our town, it is our community. We all we all have a piece in this, right? We got to work together. So. Um, I guess uh, we'll just uh, we'll, we'll do this in another work session on how what is the quickest, fastest, and most efficient way we can help our communities, um, and then and get around these. Well, honestly, these just look like legal obstacles. And the administration did make a comment about um, we can't get like a, a security force uh, potentially to um, um, to do these because it's the same services that APD provides. I thought that was interesting. I was going to assembly meeting. They said that we can't put a. a um, we can't put a bid out for security services in the same way that APD patrols. I mean, I know it's, it's probably it's rules and laws, um, but right now, I mean, again, we are right now we are all responsible for what we see, and it's not fair. Um, it's really not. I mean, I, again, one of our community members has PTSD because she had to give an individual CPR to save his life, and um, you know, it's just it's just really sad. It's really, really sad. And again, it's not new. This is not a new issue. Some of the neighborhoods have seen it since COVID, but we have seen it. Um, we, in Fairview, have seen it historically, and, and everyone knows about it. I mean, it's not, it's not a secret, so it would really be great to see. I would really appreciate it if everyone in this body and in all the, all the, um, in all the, all the groups would please expedite um, um, funding for however we can get it assistance in our neighboring uh, in our neighboring areas and I, I really appreciate um, Daniel and Chris's efforts as well it's really hard to keep pushing a lot of people leave and um, maybe some of us aren't leaving maybe that's a tour our assembly should do is a street tour you know that's great I, I'm so glad you mentioned it because there have been a lot of tours lately on, on we do lots of construction sites and we do lots of uh, art centers and things like that but maybe there have been tours there. recently on Yamble because of the snow storage, the skinny sidewalks, we've had deaths on the street. So, and there have been there have been a lot of efforts lately just to, to open people's eyes to a little bit more rather than just driving down anger and gamble. So thank you for your time, everyone. Thank Thanks, you. Mr. France. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for being here. And I do support Mr. Bowman and Mr. Constance's proposal. Just a quick question. Do, does your community council have a community patrol? We don't currently. There was one in the past. Um, and I, I don't know the gentleman's name. There was a gentleman that um, that ran that. I know that it it was. I think it was effective to get eyes on the street. Again, there's always there's individuals. There's it's it's very challenging of working with people. 
I do that. I work with a lot of people, and I have an amazing team at my business. Um, but when it comes to you know safety um, and security, and you know where do you draw the line between just being you know a, a you know a concerned neighbor or you know making an assumption or, or trying to figure out what someone's thinking, it really gets into um, a new sort of area where I think we need professionals uh, to assist us. Um, so we're not putting our own lives at risk. We're not, you know, uh, making any assumptions, judging anyone, because in Fairview, you know, we have a really diverse range of people um, with a diverse range of challenges and also also unique gifts. We have amazing art and music, and um, you know, I'd love to see that stuff build back up. I'd love to see our school become a, a magnet school of art um, or, or music. So, um, Fairview is an amazing place. I want to end with positive there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Voland. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so, James, I see Karen's here too. Um, I know that you both have stepped up for your community in so many big ways. We talked about a volunteer led effort, and you're looking at two of the most prominent volunteers from Fairview here testifying about what's going on in their neighborhood. Um, I believe that we do have a way that we can get boots on the ground to be eyes and ears. We have a model in the English Downtown Partnership and Safety Ambassador Program. Um, one issue that I think we have is that I think citizens of Anchorage Anchorage entirely could maybe use some information, some education about who to call when. When do you call 911? When do you call for one line opportunity? When do you report something to Anchorworks? Um, and so, something I would like maybe this committee or the assembly as a whole to consider is doing a one pager, doing um, maybe a, uh, a public campaign about um, getting that message out about who to call when. Um, but what I'm imagining for Fairview in, in the near term is those eyes and ears who know when to report something. Because, James, you're a local business owner. Between the Fairview Community Council, your ad hoc uh, homelessness committee that you're chairing, uh, the Fairview Homelessness Committee, um, between the patrolling that you do around your area, um, all of your, your, your efforts you know, every time there's something happening that the police are in your neighborhood, I know I get a text from you. How many hours a week do you think you're dedicating to safety in your neighborhood as a volunteer? As many as I can. I, I don't have a number there. That's one thing I don't actually have to keep track of. It's right. Just, uh, everyone knows to let me know. Several. I I'm so sure I miss a lot. There's several hours. I know Karen is really involved with um, neighborhood beautification. She puts flowers in her neighborhood. So the people of Fairview have stepped up in really big ways to, to do what they can to to improve their neighborhood. Um, so I think we are at the point where we need to um, give them some support beyond what they can do in a volunteer capacity. That's my personal feeling. Uh, anyway, but thank you for answering my question. Today. Thanks, Daniel. We have a neighborhood plan we're really excited about. Um, the team has been working on Alan Kemplin, Sharon Shamar. We have, you know, Aaron Heat was there for a long time. A lot of great people, you know, Chris Constant. Um, we have a lot of plans. I think there's a bright future. I think we can make a model out of Fairview, which is what we can do with an area that um, is ready for change. So, fairness for Fairview. Mr. Jeff, I follow up really quickly. Sure. You, just because you mentioned walking towards the Gamble Negro, I do have to um, say, you know, pretty exciting news is that the governor's chief of staff just took a walking tour uh, with Chris Constant and, and Zach Phillips and some other folks. So absolutely would be happy to um, to join other members as well and have you lead us on a walking tour. That'd be great. Well, yeah, I would love to do it. I'm new and a lot of other people have a lot more information than me, but you know, let's let's increase tourism. Let's let's get people to stay in Alaska. Let's show off, you know, an area that uh, tourists see and, and also um, uh, reinvigorate an area of the town that, that shows the diversity Alaska has to offer. Thanks, Jim. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Welcome. Could you turn on the mic, please? It's the green button, I believe. There you go. My name is Karen Lumiero, and I live in Fairview for the last 10 years or so. I actually lived there when I was five, and I know when they did the big construction. 
I want to thank everybody for your work. Um, you guys asked a lot of questions, <clears throat> answered a lot of what I was going to mention. But um, citizens being involved is great. Do I look like I want to walk down the street when it's dark and scary? No. I have a hard time just walking down the bike trail in the day of the sun, which saddens me because it's right three blocks away from me. So when I think about eyes on the street, mental health, the fire department, the police officers, um, is it true that a fire truck used to park downtown when Brother Francis was having so much trouble? All the calls that used to go to Black Angus. If there's a way to get 24-7 presence parked in the Sullivan that literally walks, uh, even with volunteers, I could go for a walk if I knew there was somebody with the authority to arrest, the training to tackle people. Uh, I used to work with the detectives through the sexual assault uh, program. And I, I watch those guys, you know, when it's a scary perpetrator that I have to, like, confront. I personally am not going to do that at the of the night. So eyes on the ground means somebody who has the authority, the power to arrest people that are doing illegal things and take them to jail. Uh, but also the mental health. Um, I have a fourplex and I have three tenants, all of whom have those issues. And I've worked with some of those agencies that can come in when someone's in crisis, talk them down, and I've seen how permanent safe housing helps your mental health. Um, I've watched them go from being psychotic a lot to okay and able to stay in housing. So I think those are very important components when you have eyes on the ground um, that can actually offer help and have a place for those kinds of issues to be resolved the sides on the street. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Welcome. Yeah. Hi, my name is Jenny. I um sorry about your situation with the Um we've gone to baseball games and it's a little creepy. Just walk in from your car and I can stay down. So um, I just wanted to tell you guys some ideas that I had because I see the homeless population growing, becoming more dangerous. Um, my first piece of advice is don't follow the lower, lower 48's example because it's getting worse down there too. Um, I want to say don't encourage dependence on us. Um, if you offer things for free, people are going to take it and they're going to be dependent on that. And um, we should be encouraging independent behavior. Um, don't give food out for free. Yes, it can be super cheap. <laughs> but if you give food for free, people are going to take the free things and they're just feel entitled to it. And it's not helping. Um, so charge something for your services, whether it be housing or food or um, uh, medical services, whatever it is. Um, uh, my practical advice for the homeless problem for people who don't want to be homeless, uh, I think that we should have hired day laborers. I think that it would be a great idea to pay somebody for uh, their, their labor, um, whatever deemed necessary, um, however much are able to pay, I think that would be a great way to get people back on their feet, they can make money, they could pay for the housing, they can pay for the food, um, and a lot of people need employees nowadays. So if we could offer that um, as a way to get people some money in their hands to get them out of their situation, I think that would be perfect. Um, I think that we should, um, you know, help people who, who want help. If people want to be homeless, it's their choice. If we want to own a house or to rent, it's our choice. They should be responsible for those choices, um, for the consequence, consequences and the trade-offs for, for not having a house payment. So um, that's just kind of the things I wanted to come talk to you guys about and see if, I don't know if day laborers are even an option, but if that's something that we could look into and see if um, 
it can help people get out of their situation and be good. Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else like to participate? All right, not seeing anyone else, then we'll move on to committee discussion. Is there any further discussion from members? Yes, go ahead, Mr. Cross. Yeah, uh, about two weeks ago, I did have a chance to uh, tour the Barrett Inn, um, the one that's Denard, that uh, Rasmussen and the Alaska Housing Trust is taking over. And to give you my perspective, I was actually surprised at how good of condition that building is. As you guys know, I've been a, well, my history as a contractor for nearly 20 years, buying distressed apartment buildings. I was a little concerned, but the overall newer boilers, newer windows, actually the building's in really good condition. Um, uh, my my perception and looking at it is there's only a couple rooms that have kitchens that they can place in right away, but once they close, you're probably looking at a 60, 90 day to build some sort of community kitchen since it is housing, and there's not a lot of laundry or kitchen services. So I anticipate that as soon as they close, There'll be some scattered rooms that have kitchenettes to be able to use, but total occupancy is probably going to take a couple months as they make adjustments to the property. But it's actually, it looks like it's, uh, and, and the way they modeled it with the trust fund, and just so you understand, so people have on record, about 20% of the revenues that's generated from rents um, are going back into reserves, So, which is a really nice model. You know, normally when we're purchasing properties and we take things, they don't take uh, maintenance and upkeep into consideration, but this has a 20% 20, uh, 20 reserve factor for income for future maintenance and repairs, which I thought was very important. So they're not coming back again and again going, oh, by the way, we need money for X. So the structure of it financially uh, looks attractive. The building overall condition was better than I anticipated. But as far as, remember, it was a hotel, we're gonna need some kitchen spaces. So. You know, if you're thinking that it's going to be at 50% occupancy in 45, 60 days, you know, you got it. They got the kitchen issues, and they got some lease up process to go through. But um, overall, it looked like a, it looked like a good project. So thank you. Thank you. Any other community discussion? All right, not seeing any. Thanks, everyone. This committee is adjourned.